Okay, thanks everybody for coming. Today we're going to go over uh, cervical stenosis and posterior cervical laminoplasty uh, for cervical stenosis. So the first, uh, the best way to learn, I say this every single time, but the best way to learn is from illustrative cases because when you um, when you learn from a human being, you never forget it. And this month, we have the distinct honor of actually having the patient with us in the room. So she can tell us firsthand like what it was like. So just to get things started, uh, uh, and we present it like in a certain way. So it's a 47 year old woman with um, a six month, and you can interrupt if it's different, a six month history of uh, neck stiffness and pain with uh, left arm uh, paresthesias, pins and needles, uh, into the forehand, in the forearm and hand, especially the index finger and thumb. Yeah, that's right. So, do you want to add anything to that? Like, how, how did it feel? How did you know something was wrong? It had carpal tunnel before, so I knew what that um, nerve. Damn it! It felt like going up, uh -huh. and I knew this was going down. It was going down, so it's going from your neck down instead of from your hand up. Yeah, so I knew it was something different. Mm -hmm. that's, and then, so that's why I mentioned it to the doctor. Mm-hmm. And um, what about your, what did you feel in your index finger and thumb? Like, what, describe it. Um, like like going to sleep, like when your, finger, your hand foot goes to sleep. Uh -huh. um, pins and needles, sometimes it would be numb. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't painful necessarily, it just was aggravating. Like a weird buzzing sort of sensation yeah, in your hand. Exactly, like bees in there. Mm -hmm. Was it worse when you moved your neck? No. It was not worse when what, at any. What moment. would make it worse? It. I don't think anything made it Nothing. worse or better. It Nothing just, that you can realize. Right. Okay. And how about your balance? Do you have any problems with your balance? No, I had no problem with my balance. How about with the function of your hand? I have my function. Of my hand was weak. I was I, actually. I think my right side was weaker than my left side, mm -hmm. which was is kind of strange because I had my symptoms. Physical symptoms on my left on my left side, but the right side was losing losing strength, strength in your hand. Right. Okay, great. Um, anything else you want to add? No. Okay. So, Aaron, um, what do you think of these X-rays? Describe them. Uh, cervical spine, AP, and lateral. Um, there, there's no curvature. Okay, loss of normal cervical lordosis. So normally you have a nice lordosis to the cervical spine and the spine here is straight. In fact, I, I, um, I uh, measured here six degrees of kyphosis. So it's going the opposite direction a little bit. And how about on the AP film? Um. Anything? Yeah, it doesn't have to have anything. Okay, so pretty normal in the AP film. A little bit, I, I can see she's got some uncle osteophyte. So where the two bones come together, there's a little bit of spurring here in here, which is uh, quite common. See how she doesn't have it there? I'm not sure if you can see, but yeah. there's extra white bone, extra sclerosis or whiteness of the bone, which means harder, and also extra bone, which is spurs here and here, which you don't see at C4, C5. And no loss of normal cervical lordosis. So the neck is bent sort of the wrong way. And I'll tell you why that's um, um, uh, a problem. So he this is the sagittal cut of the MRI scan. And um, just to orient everybody, this is the spinal cord. Uh, this is the base of the brain. Uh, these are the vertebral bodies. And between the vertebral bodies, which are the shapes of, say, cubes, there's a disc or a, shop, uh, a soft uh, tissue structure. So this is C3, C4, C4, C5, C5, C6, and C6, C7. And there's a couple, what, uh, what other, like what general things do you see, Aaron? Do want to add, like, is, is, uh, is it normal? Is the area for the spinal cord normal? No, there's a loss there. Um, the disc is... Uh, so she's, yeah, so she's panel. got disc bulges here, 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 and here that are compressing into the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. And you see, normally, the spinal cord, this is the from C7 to T1. Normally, the spinal cord should have plenty of room. See this white stuff mm -hmm. here above and uh, in front and behind it? That's uh, cerebral spinal fluid, CSF. You should have plenty of room for your spinal cord at every single level in the cervical spine. And you can see that these disc bulges here, 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 and here are pressing into the spinal cord. But there's something that is also present here that's unusual is this black line. 
So see this black line all the way across? Yeah. Now it's not very big, but it's significant in the sense that the spinal cord is a very sensitive structure. And anything in the spinal canal, compressing the spinal cord causes a problem. So whatever this black line is, it's in a very, very sensitive place and it's pressing in on the spinal cord. So um, the other interesting thing is um, the uh, discs have a normal height. So this is not, if this was degenerative disc disease, the discs would be flatter. So this is not a typical cervical degenerative disc disease case um, because of that. Um, so anything else, any questions so far? Does the kyphosis give laxity to the PLL and that, that's why it's buckling into the spinal canal? Uh, no. Okay. So the kyphosis is only relevant because for laminoplasty, you can't, the spinal cord has to drape backwards. And if the cervical spine is kyphotic, it's not able to drape backwards. I'll show you, I'll show you more in, in the future. So here's another cut. You see how the spinal cord has very little room from here, from C3 to C7. So now this is an axial cut at C3. And here's the spinal cord. And here's the area for the spinal cord. And you see this black thing right here. So that is not supposed to be there. Normally, pe most people don't have that sort of thing. And that, it's, uh, it's ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament, OPLL, which is what we're going to talk about today. So normally, there's a, a ligament that's in the back of the vertebral bodies that goes up and down the spinal canal. And sometimes, in some people, nobody knows why, it ossifies. It turns into bone, and it grows. So it grows into bone spurs. Mm -hmm. So it's an unusual diagnosis, and it's most common in Japan. You have any? Are you are, are you relatives from Japan? Are you ancestors? We is it, It's a huge joke now in my family <laughs> because we all, all of us when we smile we squint and we You're, have no. We're no Irish. Texas, right? Yeah, we're Irish, Irish from German Texas and French. All right. And so yeah. We all laugh and say so the answer is the Irish yeah. milkman in the family yes. somewhere. Something happens somewhere. So <laughs> it's very common. For some reason, it's very common in Japan, and no, I'm not sure why. I'm not sure if. Uh, People of Japan ancestry, when they come to the United States, do they lose this OPLL? I'm, I'm not sure if it's diet or what. Uh, there's other things that are common in Japan that aren't common here, like um, I think gastric cancer. But then when they come here to the United mm -hmm. States, it goes away. So, uh, so it may be diet related. So, so you see, the spinal cord is compressed uh, from this um, black lesion, which is um, cortical bone. So this is at the level of the C3, C4 disc space, and you see this central protrusion here compressing the spinal cord centrally. C4, C5, very similar process, but it's not as round. It's kind of focal, compressing the center of the uh, spinal cord. Yeah. Uh, now, this is, good morning, Doug, come on in. Doug, this is a um, case of a um, 47-year-old woman with uh, cervical stenosis and uh, radiculopathy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have the distinct pleasure of the patient is here herself. She's uh, joining us for the conference. She's uh, four weeks out from the laminoplasty. So we're just going over the uh, MRI scan. Uh, this is a sagittal cut, which shows a um, little room for the spinal cord. And we're doing, going through the axial cuts now, C4, C5 centrally. So what I did here, um, Aaron, is I, I want to measure the spinal cord. And I'll tell you why in a second. This is, these blocks are all the same. So you can see the, 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 um, the spinal cord has supposed to have a certain shape. Now in her at C4, C5, the anterior posterior distance is one third of the uh, width, okay? And that's not normal. So you see, because the, you, can, you can imagine the more this flattens out, the bigger the ratio gets. So that's a, that's a serious problem because the spinal cord uh, should not be compressed. This is C4, C5. C5, C6, it's even worse. The other thing at C5, C6, on the left here, the hole where the nerve runs out of the frame is tight. It should be a lot bigger like this one. The nerve exits this hole. And here, she's very tight at C5, C6. The C6 is where the, the gives sensation usually to the thumb and index finger. And she was having those symptoms. And that's the left hand side. That's the left side, yes. Uh, yeah. So that would explain her thumb and index finger uh, is this frame is tight. And then C67, similar findings, and C, now here's C71. Now look at the shape of the spinal cord. Much different, right? The ratio of the anterior to posterior to the width is only one to two, uh, versus here, it's three, it's three to one. So 
that that's what the spinal cord should look like normally. So this was studied, the mid sagittal diameter to the width, if the ratio goes to one in five, which is, which is not bad, as bad as this case, this is one in three, but when it gets to one in five, it causes um, uh, uh, ischemia uh, and um, direct uh, spinal cord um, uh, damage. So this was, um, this was done, uh, this was a pathological study, it was people who had died and they studied the spinal cord and they found some of the people who had died had cervical stenosis that was never treated. And they found when they looked at the spinal cord that if the ratio was one to five, the spinal cord itself was seriously damaged. So if it gets to that point, uh, it's a very serious problem. Like basically, you don't want to get to that point. So just, so any questions so far about this case? Okay, so cervical stenosis. So just to, so you understand to know what something's abnormal, you need to know what normal is. Normally, the spinal cord lives in the spinal canal, and you see it has plenty of room with plenty of CSF about it. And on the axial cut, you should see a lot of white all around it. And the spinal cord lives within the spinal canal, um, which is a tube that looks similar like that. Now, the pro what, it, what's, what does cervical stenosis cause? When it causes myelopathy, the symptoms are very, very mild. And, and you, you people don't know what's going on. Their hands don't work and their balance is off. So people say similar things like, I can't button, uh, I can't uh, open jars, um, my hands are not working right. If it's someone with, did you have things like that? Uh, jars, yeah. Jars, you're just weak, the intrinsics are weak basically. Mm -hmm. So and they, they tell you things like that. They say some people, some people who are really in tune say my hand doesn't work like it used to. I, I had one patient who was a guitar player, he's like, I can't, I can't play the guitar, my fingers just aren't working like they should. Um, and the other thing is balance is off. They, people say, you, you didn't have any balance problems, did you? No. So some people say, I, I walk like I'm drunk, uh, I'm clumsy, I tend to list to well, one side. A lot, I think it's uh, proprioception. So the uh, uh, proprioceptive tracks uh, to the spinal cord are uh, damaged and for some reason I think they're more sensitive than the other tracks. Okay, so just more anatomy. The spinal cord should have plenty of room and CSF about each side. Uh, more anatomy. So how much room should the spinal cord have? Now, the ballpark figure is about 17 millimeters mid-sagittal diameter. This is from uh, Rene Louise, the textbook, um, and he measured it himself, and he found it was more like 14 or 15. So it should be like 16 or 17, something like that. The spinal cord itself is about 10 millimeters in most people. I'm talking anterior posterior diameter. So, so basically, the spinal cord, this spinal cord is about 10 millimeters, and the area for your spinal cord should be somewhere between 14 and 17. So you can see if that's 10, you know, the spinal cord out here is about 14 to 17. So there should be. 30% or so all about the spinal cord at every single level for the spinal, you know, normally. And you can see here, this it's clearly not enough room for the spinal cord. Okay. Um, now, normally, you can get bone spurs pushing into the spinal canal, but they're usually associated with the disc. See, they're on either side of the disc, and that's called end plate spurring. But in these cases, you see how the disc is flat? The disc is deteriorating, and because you have a loss of function of the disc, what happens to bone is that bone, uh, Doug, what happens to bone when it has increased uh, forces uh, across it? Say like the cartilage is not working in the knee, what does the bone do to offset the increased forces? What, what, what does it create? It remodels, it becomes sclerotic. So, so it gets... It uh, means it's uh, more mechanical and less... Denser. Less, um, Less biologic. Yeah, so it gets denser and, it, and it's, it's wider, sclerotic, which is what we call sclerotic. And it also grows spurs. It grows, the area grows because pressure equals force over an area. So to decrease the pressure, which your body wants to, it increases the area so it, grows, it gets bigger. So just like if you, if you take your finger and push really hard against someone's chest, that hurts. But if you push with your, with your palm, it doesn't hurt so much. So if you have a very small area, the same pressure, uh, the same amount of force causes a lot of pressure, so your body sort of knows that. So this is one more. Th this is one more uh, anatomy, so you understand what we we're talking about. The spinal cord, and there's a hole where the nerve runs out, which we call the foramen, and the spinal cord should have a certain amount of room.
Now, what happens in ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament? The back of the uh, um, vertebral body is where the posterior longitudinal ligament lives. So I just put PLL, so you know that means posterior longitudinal ligament. And the yellow thing is your spinal cord. Now, for some reason, this PLL grows and ossifies. So you can see here, it's starting to grow, and it's pushing in towards your spinal cord. And then the more it grows, you see the spinal cord is getting compressed. And at this shape, I usually, when I see this, at this point, the spinal cord assumes a triangular shape just because of the anatomy. And uh, you know, I note that in my uh, MRI dictation because that's obviously not normal. The spinal cord should not be a triangle. It should be more like a sort of, not, not say football, but kind of like a, what's that called? Like a, a lip sort of. Uh, yeah, like an like a, like a mild oval. Yeah. How long does it take to get to that point? Years. This this process takes years. So if you compress the spinal cord very quickly, to that amount of compression, the patient will be paralyzed. Okay. So the spinal cord is able to withstand pressure if it's pushed on very 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 slowly, mm -hmm. but it happens real fast. The patient gets paralyzed. So this could have been my whole life. Man, probably more been like been ten years. Probably more like ten years. Okay. Maybe ten or fifteen years. So increased pressure, and then at some point the spinal cord becomes flat, and you can see this is a case, this is what the spinal cord would look like if it was like five to one. And we know at this level because of ischemia, because there's not enough blood supply to the spinal cord from this pressure, and also from direct damage, the spinal cord becomes necrotic, or basically the spinal cord dies. Now, how do you treat? Now, this is what you do in laminoplasty. In laminoplasty, you burr down half of the lamina on one side, and the whole way on the other side. And then you flip it open. So now the spinal cord has more room. And then the spinal cord resumes a more normal shape and, and basically migrates backwards posteriorly. And then you hold it open with something. Um, and I, I usually use a plate and screws. And so it won't flap back down. What about the black stuff that's just going to always stays there. It's always going to be there. Okay. Now getting that black stuff out is very hard because it uh, it's very difficult because it's a very deep hole and sometimes it can be scarred down to the spinal cord. It's fine. So it's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So but you can do it. It's called the anterior approach. So just one more thing that's interesting about the lamina, Aaron. I'll put this in there for you, for you. Is that it's thin on the bottom inferiorly and thick superiorly. So when we do these uh, troughs. It's very easy to, to birth through the bone inferiorly, but you're protected inferiorly by the ligamentum flavum. So um, it, it's pretty safe. But if you go through here more superiorly, it's dura. So you can injure the dura and cause a spinal fluid leak. So that's one, that's one thing you have to understand about the lamina. So we're going back to our case now. So it's a 47 year old woman, neck stiffness and left upper extremity pain. Um, and um, I, I elected to uh, perform a laminoplasty. So you can treat you can treat things in different ways. It's either basically in the cervical spine, it's the anterior or posterior approach. The posterior approach in laminoplasty is better because you can open up the whole spinal canal. So you can open up from C2 to C7. If you did it through the front, it'd be a very big operation in the front of the neck, and then you get problems with the airway, esophagus, it's a long surgery, um, and then you also have to fuse it. In laminoplasty, you don't have to fuse it. So the patient can still move their neck completely. So. So the, in, in this case, uh, I put plates at C3, C5, C7. I like to not put a plate at C4 because it's not necessary because the other plates will hold it up. And just so you understand again, um, you make two cuts, one halfway, one the other way, and you open it up and you can use either a plate. And this is, um, this is another way to do it. You can put a screw or a, a tack with a uh, wire or a suture to hold it open. I, I think the plate's better, but I've done it both ways. And here's a, here's a model of the cervical spine, and you make a trough on one side with the burr, and then on the other side of the burr, on one side you go only halfway, that's the hinge side, and on the, on the other side you go all the way through, that's the side that opens up. And this is the plate that I used in this case, it's, um, it's a Medtronic plate, and um, this side <clears throat> goes into the lamina, and this side goes into the lateral mass, and there's these tiny little screws, you can see that's my finger, so you can see how small this plate is. Yeah, and here's the post-operative uh, image with the laminoplasty plate holding open the lamina. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a post-operative uh, CAT scan or CT scan. And this is this is at C3. This is the trough. This is the halfway through side, the hinge. And this is the open side. And you can see this plate is uh, opening the spinal canal. And now there's plenty of room uh, for the spinal cord. 
And here's the OPLL, which is still present, but now that we have more room, uh, it's not pressing on the spinal cord. Here's at C3, you can see the plate holding open um, the um, laminoplasty. And, and this is, uh, this see this big white thing? This this is the, the what I said before in the MRI is the black line. But in MRI scans, the cortical bone, it, it looks as black and doesn't look as oppressive. For to look, to see cortical bone well, you need a CAT scan. You can see here in the CAT scan, um, the uh, OPLL, which is compressing the spinal cord. Here's C4, C5, C6, and C7, which uh, was normal and wasn't done. So you may say, like, is this, is it, what happens to this thing? What does it look like years later? Like, how does it heal? And this is what, this is what a person looks like three years later. This is, this, uh, I did this CT myelogram for a different reason. It was a patient who had a laminoplasty but had lumbar stenosis and I needed to get a myelogram because she had a pacemaker. And I said to the radiologist, if you're gonna do the myelogram, let me see the cervical spine as well because I'm curious to see what uh, it looks like. She's in the scanner anyway. So this shows what happens. The lamina totally heals up. It, it gets, um, it was burned halfway through, but you see how it heals like a broken bone. And this whole arch becomes now reconstructed. And you could probably take this plate out because this thing is all healed. So it's healed in an open position. And the benefit of laminoplasty is this bone now um, is present and the muscles heal down to the lamina, to the bone, and that makes the neck strong. So the neck sort of recreates a normal, um, a normal anatomy again. Now, if you take the whole lamina off, which, is, which was the old way to do it, a laminectomy, which still works, but there's no attachment area for the muscles. So the neck gets weak if you, did not, if you do a full laminectomy, if you take the entire lamina off. And that kind of explains why laminoplasty is better than a full laminectomy when you take the whole bone off. Does that make sense, Aaron? And here's the, here's, you can see what the spinal cord has plenty of room now after this area has been opened up. Now she has a little bit of kyphosis. Now can you see how the spinal cord is draped backwards? Mm -hmm. And you see if the patient is kyphotic, kyphotic or bent in this direction, the spinal cord still has some pressure. See that? So optimally, you want to have cervical lower doses but if the patient has like less than 15 degrees of kyphosis it still works and that's controversial too some people say you can do uh, uh, laminoplasty in people with kyphosis so here's here's our case and you can see the OPLL this is post-op this is where the plates are you can see this what was the black line you can see that it's it's uh, the OPLL is present and Aaron this is um, extra credit question why the black line, this is a bonus question. The, the black line was continuous on the MRI and yet on the CAT scan is not continuous. So why is that? Why is this here black and this here white? Type but, of bone. Okay, that's, that, actually that's good. So what makes, what makes the bone white on the CAT scan? What element? Uh, calcium. Calcium, right. So now, let me, ref let me ask the question again. Why is this part of the OPLL black and this part of the OPLL white. It's not completely calcified. It's not completely calcified, right. Mm -hmm. So we know like, like Doug, can you tell everybody like when you take care of fractures that incomplete classification or fracture healing or if you yeah. want. You mean like you have a joint there or, or a false joint or? Um, no, let's say uh, like um, in residency, I used to always oh. call it uh, clinically healed but radiographically oh, lagging. Right. <clears throat> so so you have some matrix that's laid down but it's not completely calcified. Yet. Yeah, so part of the healing process it's 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 going on the bone it's it's cartilage which doesn't have calcium but a, as it evolves and matures it becomes calcified and then you can see it on the x-ray. So this this is sort of like a similar process where the OPLL is sort of like a fracture that's healing. It's probably cartilage, it's thick and it's evolving into a bone but it's not calcified yet and you can't see it totally on the CAT scan. <laughs> So it's kind of it's kind of interesting. So here it just shows the lateral mass screws uh, in the um, lateral mass. Is that going to happen again? That I don't know. Like, is it going to? Uh, another question is: Is it going to get worse? Like, is it going to is it going to push more on the spinal cord? Like failed cervical laminoplasties. I don't think it does. I don't think it can grow that big. But it's possible. If that happened, you'd have to go back and probably take the whole lamina off. You would have to. <laughs> well, hopefully, you, hopefully you'll get like a, a lot of calcification on the posterior longitudinal area now, extra, extra laminar. 
and you'll have almost like a, a fusion. Yeah, it'll probably get, it may get stiffer and just stop. And so you, you, you'll avoid some more kyphosis. Mm -hmm. I mean, but anytime you operate near bone, there's a chance that you get, you know, calcification or scarring, or especially if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. So here's the post-op MRI. So you see now the spinal cord has plenty of room. See that? And there's CSF all around the spinal cord. Remember before it was flattened? And it, and here's it. Now, see, 5C6, you can't really see so well because the titanium plate uh, makes a black mark on the MRI scan. But you can sort of see the spinal cord now has a lot of room. Who else makes those plates, bro? Medtronic. Is that it? Oh, who else? Everybody yeah. makes them. Yeah. Synthes, yeah, Depew, everybody, everybody makes them. So this is just the before, remember the black line pushing on the spinal cord, very little room, and the, af and the after, see there's a black line both in front and behind the spinal cord now. And you see how you, ha you need lordosis for the spinal cord to drape backwards. Now she didn't have kyphosis, so she's not a, a completely optimal candidate, but I think it's sufficient. This is another view. So just one more, one more so you understand the process. This is at C4 pre-op. The spinal cord's flat, and there's the OPLL pushing in on the spinal cord. Now that the lamina's been opened, you see how this spinal cord's got plenty of room, and the spinal cord is now assuming a normal shape. And you can see here the bone. You can't see how you see, can't see the bone very well in the MRI scan, but you can see it very well in the CAT scan. And you can see the half cut, and then the opening there that was made. And this is the diagram, so you understand you know, what's going on. And this is what it looks like in, in the surgery. These are the laminoplasty plates. And this here is your spinal cord. And it's, see how it's opened up? And you can see the spinal cord. And the spinal cord's got a lot of room now. Yeah, I'll show you the surgery. And this is six, uh, this is six or four weeks out. OK, so any questions? <laughs> so is, are we going? No, we watch on TV. <laughs> OK, so. Who won the most medals? What country won the most medals in the last Winter Olympics? Uh, Finland. Germany? Norway? I don't know. Russia? I don't know. United States? Really? Really? USA. Go USA. USA, um, Germany, and then Canada. Cool. But Canada won the most gold medals. Mm -hmm. USA won the most medals, but they didn't win the most gold medals. Mm -hmm. Go Canada. They're tough. They're a small country, too. So this shows... D hmm? Small. It's a sm population. population. Small cut, yeah, like 20 million or something, 30 million. So these are. <laughs> yeah, Germany's 60 million, I think. How big, how big is Germany? Fit 40, 40 million? I'm not sure. I don't know. I thought Canada was bigger than Germany. I'm not sure. Let's focus on OPLL. Greece was not, Greece was not in the uh, top five. We, we only swim. We, don't, we can't deal with water in a hard form. <laughs> So this just shows different ways that you can have OPLL. It can be separated or it can be all together. I think it's just uh, where you find it on the disease process. How does OPLL differ from DISH? It, it, it's, it, um, it's very similar. I mean, the way I look at it in my mind, it's a cousin of DISH. But what is it when you have... Uh, DISH is diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, right? Go ahead. What is it when you have the lamina and... Um, the spinous processes. I always thought that was dish, where it was, um, where dish was more extra. Um, extra canal. Canal, yeah. That, that's yeah. That's that's what most people think. But you know, if I, I think personally, if you get a CAT scan of these people, they have dish. Uh, they have dish in their um, really? in the lower back. A lot of times, you just see it on X-ray. You know, where you just see their whole spinous processes sort of. Well, you get cervical spine is sort of fused. Yeah, but also you get the ALL, the anterior longitudinal ligament gets calcified and really massive sometimes too. In DISH. Uh, yeah, in DISH and I think in OPLL. Right. Like, so I, I, I think OPLL is probably, it just happens to be posterior and DISH is probably anterior or lateral, mm -hmm. you know? So these are just different cases and you can see like the, the bone can get um, very large and compressed into the spinal canal and it can look all sorts of different ways. And these are, the, the OPLL, it can be a sessile, or like a broad, or it can be pedunculated, like really sharp. So it can be all sorts of shapes and forms. So complications of the surgery, some people get deltoid atony. So you may say, what's that? Basically, the deltoid muscle, uh, which is innervated by the C5 nerve root, doesn't work. 
And you may say, well, why, why does that happen and what is that? So <clears throat> the spinal cord drapes backwards. So here's before and here's after. And you see how the laminoplasty has been done the spinal cord is going backwards now? And the midpoint of that backward shift is C5. And because it's in the midpoint, the C5 nerve root um, is, is um, stretched the most during this process. And as it's stretched, it can be injured and it doesn't work and the patient cannot raise their arm. So it's a serious, when you have a C5 palsy, it's like having a rotator cuff tear. It's a serious problem when you can't lift your hand over your head. So they're very, uh, it's very disturbing when it happens. It almost always, yeah, you're good. Yeah. It almost always comes back. And you can see in this case, uh, the patient even developed a little bit of uh, spinal cord signal change, which is spinal cord damage at C5 from this process because the nerve root is attached to the spinal cord and um, it was stretched and it was pulling on the spinal cord and it caused some damage. So that's a possible, so, so you may say, well, does that change anything you do in the surgery? It does. If there's any question about stenosis at C4, C5, which is a C5 nerve root, I do a frame anatomy. I open up the nerve to give the nerve more room to let it, to let it stretch, you know, and I'll show you what I mean by that. Is this why I had that such bad pain in my right shoulder? But very, it could be. The night of surgery. Do yes. You remember that? Yeah, I remember that. Oh, That's why I got all those CAT scans. Yeah, it, was it very, it, it very, it very could be. Okay. Very well could be. So, it, on exam, people get um, abnormal reflexes. So because there's damage to the spinal cord, the signals are changed, and um, you lack inhibition. So basically, there are reflexes that we have that are that are um, uh, suppressed by our cortex. So. Like um, and so when you when you push someone, we have reflexes. So I think my personal opinion is reflexes are to keep us standing without falling down, down constantly. So if you're standing and someone behind you kind of pushes you a little bit, your muscles fire through your spinal cord. It doesn't go to your brain. It, th it fires through your spinal cord to keep you standing. Otherwise, you would fall down. So we have these reflexes, and our brain suppresses a lot of these reflexes. I mean, it works. So if you take away your brain or your spinal cord, the reflexes go get out of whack. Um, so this is kind of like layman's terms for something. So, so one thing they get is an inverted um, supinator reflex. So when you tap on the brachial radialis, instead of going up normally, it goes down. There's other things you can do in, to test if people have spinal cord compression. You can push on their head. I never do that because I don't like doing things that hurt the people. Uh, and you can also do Lermite's test, Lermite's test, which is you flex the neck and they get like uh, radiating pains. This is the classic study that um, showed that people get worse with cervical stenosis. This is uh, from uh, London, like St. Bartholomew's in 1963. And they followed patients for 40 years with cervical stenosis in the 40s. I think, no, I think they, it was published in 1963, so the study started in 1920 and ended in 1963, and they followed people, and they found that these big blocks are people getting worse. So what happened is that people get worse in like little steps, but once they get worse, they never get better. So the disease also can be quiescent for a long time. In other words, the disease doesn't bother people. So it kind of gets worse, like their, their hand gets sloppy, and then it stays the same for five years. And they go, oh, I'm all right, my hand's a little sloppy, but it's not getting worse. And then it gets, then the other hand gets sloppy, and then they stay okay for like five years. And then they start balance problems, and then they're okay for five years. And then the balance gets even worse, and they're okay for five years. So it's the natural history is one of uh, progression and steps, and it never gets better once it goes down but it almost always gets worse. The other thing is it's the stenosis is worse in extension. So this is uh, st um, static. This is a side view extended and this is um, a side view flexed. And you can see in the extended view, you see right here and here, it's very subtle, but you see how the ligament buckles? So the ligament and flavum buckles in extension and pushes in on the spinal cord. And when you flex, it stretches and it opens the spinal canal. So that's why patients with severe cervical stenosis, they cannot look up. They cannot, they say, sometimes they say stuff like, I can't paint the ceilings anymore. Like I can't even move my neck up. And it's because their spinal cord is getting more compressed. And the other, the other learning point is in surgery, uh, if you have a patient with cervical stenosis, you have to tell the anesthesiologist, don't extend the neck to put the tube down the throat because you could potentially paralyze the patient. So now with the, with the advent of the GlideScope, it's not an issue. Like the GlideScope is so great that they, don't, they can put the tube in now without moving the neck at all. 
Don't you think, uh, Doug, the glide scope is incredible? I mean, it's really revolutionized airway treatments. And the glide scope is basically a, um, uh, a, a little camera that goes uh, that they use to put the tube in, and they and they can see everything. It's on TV set. It's kind of like, it's great. Okay, so any questions before we do our next case? Okay. That's Aaron. I have a question. Yeah, that's Aaron um, snowboarding last Aaron, weekend. Aaron, you are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> the, one of the first pictures you showed was my neck was didn't have a curve. Right, yeah. curve forward a little bit, kyphotic. How is it now? What is it? Same. Now? It's the same. It's it didn't get worse. Like yeah, it's probably not going to get better. Okay, and there was a there was a there was a hump. Is there still a hump back there on my neck? I don't know. Yeah, but that's just your skin. That's like. This is how you're formed. Yeah, okay. All right, cool. <laughs> okay. You didn't do any liposuction. No, no, no. So this is this is a really interesting case. This this man, I just, I liked him personally. He's a real, real character. He's a really nice man. Uh, so I, um, I just remember him. He was 48, and he had right fifth finger pain and numbness. So um, right fifth finger is, uh, like, what nerve roots are you thinking, Aaron? Fifth finger. Is usually ulnar nerve, typically, and in the cervical spine, C8. So it's usually the C8 nerve root, usually, or the ulnar nerve. So the C8 nerve root becomes the ulnar nerve as it goes down. So people can have, you can either have pressure on the elbow, usually, you can have pressure at the wrist as well, Guillain's canal, or you can have pressure pressure in the neck in the C, at C, uh, C7 T1, which is a C8 nerve root. So where do you see pressure on the spinal cord on the MRI scan, Aaron? C2, C3, right? This is a really small area for the spinal cord. Now, when you think, is that what we think is going on to the finger? No, right? How would C2, C3 stenosis present? We don't know. It's so high that the whole body yeah, could probably, yeah. yeah, the whole body may be affected. So it's a very high level in the cervical spine neurologically. So if you look at his MRI, his MRI, his main problem was right here. C7, T1, the frame or the hole where the nerve runs out on the left was stenotic. That was giving him his symptoms. But he also had a really small area, a small area, not super small, at C2, C3. So here's C2, see the shape of the spinal cord? And here's C2, C3. So see how the spinal cord is slightly flattened? So I told the patient that he has some stenosis at C2, C3 and that it was at a very serious place. But I didn't think it was bothering him right now because he didn't have any attacks or any problems. I said, we can, eat, we can fix both or we can just fix the one that I think is giving you a problem. He goes, Doc, I just want the one that's bothering me and we'll see what happens with the other one. So I said, okay. So we, we did a C7, T1, ACDF and the patient did great. But he came back because he says, now that you mentioned it, I appreciate you helping me, but I can't walk right. My neck hurts. My hands. Long track yeah, my hands not working. Did he have those before? Do you think? Not really. No. Not that I no. I, I don't think so. This was like five years ago. That's how C, that's how a high C two C three stenosis would present real as long track signs. Yeah, myelopathic. Yeah. Attacks, yeah. Yeah, and he was developing it. Hyperreflexia. Yeah, he wasn't hyperreflexic. I don't think he had clonus. But it wasn't. It was. It, it was. It was a mild uh, presentation. Mm. So, so in him, I did a laminoplasty because that's what we're talking about. And this is his surgery. I did laminoplasty. Played the C3, C4, C6, C7. I opened him up, and you can see here's the pre-op and the post-op. And you see how the spinal cord has plenty of room. And you see how the spinal cord draped backwards away from this thing. I didn't, I didn't take this off, but you see how it's not even close now, because the the spot. Now he had a nice lordosis, and that's why his MRI scan looks so nice. Because you see when the patient has lordosis, he, he doesn't even have that much lordosis, but he has some, the spinal cord can drape backwards. And you see, what's this white thing here in the spinal cord, Aaron? What's that? What is that? So it's called spinal cord signal change or myelomalacia, which that's a, that's a sign of spinal cord damage. So he, he's got spinal cord damage there, but now that the compressive lesion's gone, he should be okay, it won't get worse. So he developed, unfortunately he developed post-operative kyphosis from weakening of his musculature. This was like six weeks post-op, but then it, it kind of went away. After about a year, it, it got better and um, he was okay. So, you know, he's, been, he's done very well actually with his neck. Okay, so any questions about that? This is Erin from the top of the mountain. She's, yeah, she's standing at the ramp.
Okay, this is the last case. This is a 47-year-old man who presented um, last week, uh, two weeks ago with left hemiparesis. So he basically, he said he was a bricklayer. He said, the whole, my whole left side of my body doesn't work. Well, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, for a year, my left hand doesn't work. I can't grip, right, Aaron? I can't grip. What, what else did he say? He had no pain. He said, I'm pain-free. He didn't have pain, but his, um, after his primary care physician had him do some testing, they rushed him in, and then he started piecing together. Well, I do kind of have difficulty picking up things with my left hand, and but not nothing significant mm. in complaint. And he's been left dealing with tricep weakness. Left tri it's left tricep was zero out of five, right. but he just kind of blew it off. Yeah. So there's some sign there's some signs uh, on exam for myelopathy. One is the finger escape sign. So if you ask a patient to hold their hand still and hold it for a minute. They drift, and it looks like that. The fifth and fourth finger uh, get weak. Now, this man had had it so long that he was stuck like that. And I'll show you the video. The other thing is you can do a grip and release test. So you have people make a fist, open up, make a fist, open up. They should be able to do two of those in one second. So they should be just like, they should be able to go back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, and do that every half second. And the other thing is a <clears throat> Hoffman's test where you hold the fifth finger PIP joint and you flick the DIP joint and the patient involuntarily, flex, involuntarily flexes the thumb and index finger. Um, and I'll show you that. A 47-year-old man who presented with uh, left-sided hemiparesis and a weakness of his arms. And uh, this is an interesting case of um, intrasia weakness from uh, chronic cervical stenosis and nerve root stenosis. So let's take a look at the hands. So straighten out your hand all the way. See how he's stuck? Okay. Close it. See, so his interossei are weak. So the Hoffman's test is by holding the uh, PIP still, and you flick the DIP, and you see an involuntary motion of the index and thumb. Just, just relax. See how the involuntary flex? Same thing on this side. Be like a sunshine. Dr. Sunshine. Open your hands all the way. Double. So the lack of the ring finger. Who, me? Yeah. I am a good looking man, aren't I? But you guys show, you know those guys, they just show teeth. You gotta look at the farmer and show teeth. Look at this uh, step horse around. That's inverted radial reflex. See that? It should go the other way. See how he flexes forward? On this side, he's normal. Look. Wait. See how it goes up? That's a normal reflex. So for some reason, he's normal on the left. He had a couple beats, but it, yeah. Six or seven beats. Okay, that's good. Okay, that shows you the Hoffman sign. Um, Hoffman, Hoffman. Yeah. Uh oh. Okay, that showed you the finger escape sign that you're never going to forget it now, right, Aaron? Finger escape sign that, and Hoffman's. So here's his MRIs, and what does his MRIs show, uh, Aaron? Um, um, severe stenosis. Severe stenosis. See the spinal cord here? See, it's like very compressed. It's one of the worst cases I've ever seen. And very similar process. See how the spinal cords, and he has, what's this white thing in the spinal cord? What's that called? Myelomalacia. Spinal cord signal change in myelomalacia. Spinal cord signal change in myelomalacia. And you see on the CAT scan, He's not a classic OPLL because his discs are, are flat, but there, he's, he's got a lot of spurring. He may be more of like a Schorman's uh, kyphosis, Schorman's of the cervical spine, which is another disease. So here's C2, C3. See how it's compressed at C3, C4, and it's all left-sided. So I don't think it's a coincidence his degenerative disc disease all left-sided. I think he has a combination of OPLL, which is affecting the left side. And he's got like a like a Schorman's uh, of the cervical spine. C5, C6, C6, C7 is com very compressed. The C7, T1 is open and normal. And you can see here that that blackness in the spinal canal is cortical bone. See how it's it's uh, you can see on the cast game very easily at C5, C6. And C6, C7, it's all cortical. So to get that out from the front would be difficult because it, and it may be even scarred down to the door and you can get a spinal fluid leak. So now, what do we do? What surgery should we do for him? Laminoplasty. Laminoplasty, yeah. 
Yeah. So this is what we did for him. We did a laminoplasty, and we took off half of C3, some of uh, T1, and I also had to do a laminoplasty at C7 because he was very, very tight at C6, C7. And I did frame anatomies at C4, C5, C5, C6, and C6, C7. You may say, why? And this is the frame anatomy. You drill the medial border of the facet, exposing the nerve root as it exits. You don't want to take more than half because then the facet becomes uh, unstable. And I did C67 because his triceps not working, C7. And I did C5, C6 um, because I, could, I couldn't be sure that it was all coming from C67. And then I did C4, C5 prophylactically because he was tight and I didn't want him to get uh, deltoid at any post-op. So here he is post-op and you can see now the spinal cord's got plenty of room after the laminoplasty. And you can see now the spinal cord's got plenty of room. And see how, see how I had to do C7, Aaron? Because this is C6, C7. And that's a C7 lamina. See how that was necessary? And now he's got plenty of room there. And this just shows you post-op, the area for the spinal cord is much larger. And this foramen was opened. It, it doesn't, see how the, the foramenotomy opens up this tube? Can you show his uh, pre-op film? X-rays or MRI? So, um, you know, uh, a laminoplasty is pretty nice, but it looks like he's got a pretty unstable degenerative spine, though. Also, what's his, um, you know, short short term follow up he, as far as stability? Well, he may need more surgery in the front. Yeah. So. That's all he may, and, I, and initially I told him he's gonna need two surgeries. And I thought about it, I was like, let me just do laminoplasty and see how he does. But he may need to have this these discs removed from an anterior brooch as well. But I like to do things in staged manners. I don't like doing big surgeries all at once. Understood. Okay. But you know, on the one before you showed what looked like pretty rapid uh, progression of kyphosis. After a laminoplasty, yeah. And I wonder, is there like a, I think he's unlikely to develop it. A lot of it is sort of a gestalt, but if you look at these things, you know, man. But look, look at all these. Normal. Look at all these spurs anteriorly, though. I, I don't think he's going to become kyphotic. But you're right. Is it possible? So here's a, a post-op. So pre, and you can see pre and post-op. You can see now the spinal cord's got plenty of room here, and the frame and is is is, is open. Forty seven. He's pretty young. Yeah, it's a you can see how the framing was opened up here too. You don't need that much room. You know, the spinal cord is the size of a piece of spaghetti, so it doesn't have to be massively opened. Okay, let's, um, that was my last slide. Let's see the surgery. Hold on, sorry. Okay, just so you, so you guys can understand the anatomy. This was this man's case. <clears throat> this, is, this is the lamina. The head is to the left. The feet are to the right. Um, this is where the two lamina meet. This is the posterior spinous process. And I'm just kind of looking at the um, anatomy, and I was, uh, I'm about to start the uh, frame anatomy. <clears throat> so I'll show you. So the frame anatomy, basically, I've already done one here. So I'm, first it starts with just drilling a hole. So you drill a hole, remember we talked about you drill the medial border of the facet? You drill a hole to open up the nerve root. This has already been done. So. After you do the first one, the second one's easy because you kind of know where it goes because it's uh, you just go in the same exact place that you did it, so you can do it a lot faster. The second one is usually a lot faster, <clears throat> and you drill away uh, the bone going towards the nerve. The superior part uh, you can go fast because um, it's a, it's a sh they're shingled, so the first one is um, protected from the bottom one. Um, but the bottom one you have to go slower because directly underneath it is the dura and the spinal cord, so you have to be careful. Uh, so you thin, you go the first, you go through the superior portion all the way down to the next one. You can see the facet, so you know then you've gone through the superior portion. And the inferior portion, you go slowly, you thin it all the way down until it's like a paper thin bone, 
and then you pick the rest of it away with the mica carettes, which which is a much um, more delicate way to do it. So here we're mostly down. That's Aaron folk um, sucking with the suction, and then that's the me with the mica carette just picking away the final sliver of bone and. Um, and that, that, that soft stuff is a uh, capsular tissue and removing the final portion of the facet off the nerve root. Almost as good as your snowboarding. <laughs> yeah, Aaron's athletic. <laughs> She's a snowboarding mom. <laughs> so now this is uh, at the bottom now. We did our framings. We had to do three of them. Now <clears throat> this is T1. And I remove the superior portion of T1 to expose the spinal cord. That way I know that C7 is totally uh, separated from T1. And I start by just thinning the most superior portion of the lamina to get down to the ligamentum flavum. So now I'm thinning uh, T1. And then I finish it with a, a kerosene punch. See the kerosene punch? That removes the last portion of the ligament which is connected to the bone. So... Next is the trough. So one side, remember, remember I said you go halfway through? So this is, this is the part that I go halfway through and I'm using some wax to stop the bleeding from the bone. The bone can bleed sometimes. And that, that's a flow seal, it's a Baxter um, uh, medication that stops bleeding. Uh, it's, it's incredible. Do you use flow seal, uh, Don? Mm -hmm. Really good, really good um, uh, thrombotic. And see with the burr, I'm thinning, I'm thinning down. I'm going halfway through to well, weaken the one side, which is going to be the hinge side. And then I'll show you the door part. Now, this is the other side. I'm, I have to go all the way through. So I'm thinning it through. But on this side, this is the door side. Hold on. No, that's not the door side. This is the door side. So I've, I go all the way through the door side that I move open. Then with the kerosene punch, I remove the last portion of the bone to fully disconnect it because we're going to have to open up the door side. And that's a kerosene punch and you see that's totally making a, a complete a cut within the lamina. And then finish the door and then 139 is the plate. So you have to cut all the lamina to totally loosen up and just stopping bleeding. have to do all of them C3 C7 so this is the final portion so they're all loose now and that's this is Aaron with her curette holding it open for me very carefully and I'm removing the last portions of the ligament of flavum which tether the lamina to the lateral mass that disconnect it see I'm pulling away that little ligament and it's still not loose enough. See how she's pulling up? It's not. It's still not loose enough. But you don't want to pull too hard because then it will break. Mm -hmm. See how she's gently pulling. So I'm pulling it up, and then Aaron's keeping whatever I get. See how I'm pulling it up gently, slowly lifting it. See. And that one's still tight. C7 is a big one, so it's uh, it's very thick. It's hard to get it just right. So now I'm about to put the uh, plate on. So. Just give me a second. Right now, I'm, 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 I have the plate in my hand, and I'm, the, the plate always has to be bent a tiny bit. Um, I guess Medtronic didn't design it perfect, so I always have to bend it a tiny bit. I should use the Depew plate, right? I wouldn't have to do that if I used Depew. <laughs> okay, so uh, the plate's ready now. I said, Aaron, pull it up for me. Actually, I'm pulling it up, and then Aaron's coming in to hold it. She goes on top because I put the plate in the middle. Now pull up a little more. See, I know exactly how much I need. So here's the plate that we talked about. You can see this, the C shape of the plate goes right under the lamina. 
kind of it's kind of like a C and it holds it open. And it was uh, I just it just the shape wasn't just right to fit the plate, so I had to just trim it a little bit with the kerosene. Give me one more second. It'll, I want you to see the plate go on the uh, spine. So there's the plate. And it goes right underneath the lamina. See the C part? It goes right under the lamina. And then there's a little like in, uh, a little like uh, indentation on the bottom that keeps it still. See how it flicks into place? Mm -hmm. And that holds the lamina open. And then there's those holes for screws and we fill those holes with screws. I use the ACL, you can do it by hand, but I found that the ACL drill works, um, makes it makes it a lot easier. That's the ACL drill that I use. It drills a hole. That's metal, not plastic. Right? Titanium. Titanium. Mm -hmm. So I use the ACL drill, because th this bone is very sclerotic. It's hard to do it by hand. So that just drills the pilot hole. And then you have these tiny little screws that hold the plate still. So that's basically it. So any questions about uh, anything while you're watching this? Cervical laminoplasty? Yeah, I think it's a very nice operation. people don't know they have that I mean, stenosis yeah probably a lot probably a lot of elderly people have and they just they just live with it they just they just feel that they're getting old and weak and they just you know they don't notice the difference it, it you know it's young people that notice it because young people put a lot of demands on their body and they know something's wrong because they have to go to work they have to like this guy he's got to lay brick he goes I, I can't lay brick like I used to and he's only 47 so he noticed it very quickly, but if he was like 77, you know, he does, he's, he's fine. He does his very sedentary lifestyle. I just, I just whine a lot. That's mm -hmm. Well, I mean, no, you're 47, and you know, you, you you're uh, still active. Yeah. So that you notice it a lot more than like a 77 year old, but I would think most 47 year olds they know something's wrong when they get it, or 57. Okay, now here's here's the. Forty-six million dollar question. How long is it going to be till it's a hundred percent again? A year? Are we looking at a year? Usually months. Usually neurological recovery takes on the order of months, somewhere between four and six months. So this, this, some of this pain here is just going to. Yeah, you just—it's just, it's just four weeks out. Yeah, you, you're going to keep getting better. Okay. The fact that you're here and talking four weeks after surgery is remarkable. You're going to be fine. Yeah, most most patients and viewers don't make it. <laughs> he's a he's a he's a joker. All right. Be just here for a visit and then leave. You know, we can't, we have to discuss the Actually, he stuff hired with. he hired right yeah, in the lobby. Yeah. I have to buy a breakfast at Chick Fil A now. <laughs> so, any questions about uh, cervical laminoplasty before we wrap it up? Great. Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks so much for coming. Sure.